Calais, you are also a part of a dream team of global economists, also social science and Nobel Prize winners, which has been brought together by the International Panel on Social Progress. And you le led the chapter on social justice, well-being and economics, where you analyzed what is necessary in order to increase social justice and well-being and which possibilities we have as a society for achieving such outcomes based on economic and social and also political feasibility. But first, could you please explain to us what exactly is inequality? Inequality is a, is a, a combined measure of all the differences uh, across a group of people, say a society. If you take, think about all the income differences that are for any pair of individuals in, in that group, mm -hmm. and you add them up in a systematic way, that is inequality. If that number is large, uh, normalized, it's normalized very often between zero and one, So, mm -hmm. but that is technical thing that we don't have to be so concerned uh, about. Uh, if that number is large, then uh, the inequality is large. Mm -hmm. and, and so inequality is many things. Uh, there can be many reasons why you have all these differences across uh, any individuals. But mm -hmm. it's important to say that inequality is the entire picture of differences across groups, across individuals within groups uh, combined together. Mm. How can we learn about inequality? Well, the first thing, we, we, we have to observe what kind of inequality we have. We also have to understand there are different inequalities. We have inequality between capital owners on the one hand and wage earners on the other hand. It's called the, uh, often it's called the functional income distribution. That is the classical inequality. It was, it was studied by the classical economists uh, in the 1700s, 1800. Uh, what was they were mostly concerned about. Mm -hmm. And then you have individual uh, income differences. And you have differences between households. Mm -hmm. And all these things very often are mixed up in, uh, in, uh, in the debate. And of mm -hmm. course, you also have inequality that is more a consequence of economic differences, say inequality in political influence, in, in the power that people have, mm -hmm. uh, in the influence on policies, for example. You have all kinds of inequality, but I think at the, at the, back, the background, the foundation of mm -hmm. all these other things uh, is uh, inequality in economic opportunities and results. But what do we know about how economic inequality has developed? So we we, we don't have accurate measures of everything. The further back we go, the, the more inaccurate are, are the numbers. But uh, say from, uh, from the Second World War and onwards, we have rather precise measures of different aspects of inequality. But you should... Mm. Uh, statistical uh, inferences from these numbers can be uncertain in the sense that the observations in themselves can be a bit uh, uncertain. So Thomas Piketty, for example, he became world famous for constructing a new database focusing on the top incomes in, uh, in most societies. Mm -hmm. Sort of focusing on, I would say, not an inequality measure, but a, a, a concentration on power in the top of the income distribution. For example, uh, studying how big share the 1% riches in society, how much, uh, sh how much of the income they have. Mm -hmm. uh, typically in the US, for example, the 1% riches have around 23 to 24 percent of the income. In, in Norway, uh, this number is much lower, but still it is uh, alarmingly high. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can also study how much, how much income does the 0 point, uh, 0 point, uh, 0 0.01 percent, a much smaller, smaller group have. And again, this is relatively bigger. The smaller the group, the, the, m the larger fraction of uh, the income they own compared to the size of the group. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that is, I think, really alarming. I wouldn't call it, I would call it power 
concentration, economic concentration in the top, uh, because there can be this measure that he focuses on and became world famous for. That is uh, a measure basically uh, not about inequality further down in the income distribution. I think what Scandinavian countries are best known for is that they have small differences across ordinary people, say the 80 to 90 percent of the population. Mm. Across this set of people, differences are very small. Wage differentials, for example, compared to other countries, are small relative to elsewhere. And a, a, a number of or Piketty, uh, Piketty's favorite number wouldn't pick that up at all. Mm -hmm. So he, he wouldn't know anything, this number wouldn't know anything, it wouldn't tell us anything about uh, inequality among workers, for example, different types of workers, which is, mm -hmm. I think it can be very important. If you move from the first decile, which means that the one, uh, the group that has 10% wage earners that are poorer than themselves, mm -hmm. to the 19 decile, that means the group of wage earners that have only 10% workers richer than themselves, in Norway, this is uh, then you move up, you double the income, but in in uh, in the U.S., for example, you almost five double the income. So these are very different societies when you just focus on ordinary wage earners, so to speak. Uh, so so therefore we we have to we ha I think we have to have a nuanced view that inequality is is many things because there are different aspects of inequality. So when there are many aspects or different aspects, yeah. what aspects is it that creates inequality? So, uh, so are you asking more about the, the causes of, con of inequality or the consequences of inequality? More of the causes, what creates yeah. it? Oh, I understand. Policy so I, I understand. Yeah. Yes, th I think there are different sources. Um, first of all, we, um, part of sort of the textbook economics uh, doesn't give a real picture of how, for example, labor markets uh, work. I think it's meant more as a training. You can, you can mm. teach students about something that's not very realistic. But we, we should never start to believe in, in the textbook description of labor markets. Mm. Uh, so I think just the way you organize the labor market has tremendous implication for the inequality of wages take that as the first mm -hmm. thing. If you have social organization in the labor market, you have much smaller wage differentials. Uh, I think it's quite clear that you have strong labor unions, for example. They, uh, they compress the wage differentials over the unit that they have power of. Mm -hmm. So that if you have contracts that cover an industry, then you reduce the differentials within the industry. If you have contracts that cover uh, wages throughout the economy, uh, across sectors in the economy, for example, which is used to be the typical thing in Scandinavian countries, then you reduce differentials both across firms, mm. across industries, and across types of workers. Uh, so I think that was a social organization. Mm. The lack of social organization is a, is, is a source of, of inequality. You saw it quite clearly after Thatcher in England, then you reduce the influence of, of unions in, in, in the UK, mm -hmm. and there was an explosion of wage inequality. I, so that's one thing. The second thing uh, is, is technological change. You have, have technological change recently that is more skill biased uh, than um, used to be. That means that the, the innovations that you have benefits the skills that some educated workers may have, uh, but it substitute, uh, replace the skills that low skilled workers or low wage earners have. And that means that the demand for the high skilled goes up, uh, while it, the demand for low skilled doesn't go up to the same extent. And then you increase the gap between the two over time. And you have seen this both in the US and in Europe in general, even in our own country that you had had technical mm -hmm. change that have this. But all, and these things then have uh, implications also for the functional income distribution between capital owners on the one hand and all the wage earners uh, as a group on the other hand. But it seems to be the case, uh, at least since the 1980s, that the the share of income going to capital owners has increased over time. 
and and I think it's tied into the way innovations have come about and the type of technical change that we had, that the main beneficiaries of these things have been the capital owners. Mm. And that sort of uh, would be a source for for why so much income is concentrated uh, in the top. So I would say the more market orienta or orientation that you have, the more skilled bias technological change you have, and the less of social organization you have. These things combined mm. will sort of help explain the, the rise in inequality that we have had in all countries uh, since the end of the 80s. It started earlier in some countries, but in all countries in the end of the 1980s and until today. But the, the, if the effects are a little bit different across countries. Th it is a rise in inequality also in over part, uh, over, over, uh, over part of the world, but uh, the level of inequality is mm. still much lower here than, for example, in the US or in the UK. Sweden, for example, last observation, Sweden, for example, uh, has had a tremendous increase in inequality among ordinary people uh, in Sweden for many reasons. The decline of welfare state generosity in, in Sweden, for example. But still, Sweden is a much more egalitarian country than the UK and, and, uh, and the US. Sorry. But that means, what you're saying, it means that those who claim that the debate on inequality is a somewhat important debate, that that is not correct? I, say, I would say that it's not only somewhat important, I would say it, this, this is maybe the most important question in the world. I would say that the world is experiencing an inequality crisis. We have now just mentioned inequality across people, so to speak, within the country. But then, you ha in addition, you have these huge differences across countries. Uh, and when you add all these things, then you, you really have uh, uh, a recipe for a big catastrophe, I would say. that if, you, if, if people don't do anything about this, this will create social tensions and conflicts of a scale that uh, can be threatening. Which leads me to the next point. Uh. What does economists know about uh, how human reacts to various degrees of inequality? A at which point does inequality become a tipping point? Yeah, the, the, the these things are, I, you ask what, what do economists know about this? I would say not so much. Um, so, so this is a little bit speculative. They should have known more. We should have known more, but so far we don't know so much. So here are some observations that in countries with large inequalities, a rise in inequality is almost not noticed. And because that is procedure as, as it used to be, business as usual, inequality goes up, they, they live in a very segregated manner. The, the rich live in different parts of the cities from the, the not so rich. Uh, in, in developing developing countries, for example, the the, the rich, mm -hmm. the inequality within developing countries is much higher than in say in European countries, much higher. Mm -hmm. So this is, for example, can be just to give you a number, the Gini coefficient in, in which is one of these inequality measures in for for consumption in in uh, countries like uh, uh, Norway and Sweden is around zero point thirty, around that. Depend a little bit uh, whether you. Yeah, it depends a little bit, the year and whatever. If you look uh, at, the, at the typical uh, developing country, uh, it would be like uh, 0 0.50, which is much, much higher. And the reason is that you have a super rich group and a very homogeneous group of rather poor people within. And that means that all these differences, they, they be re will be relative to this super rich group. But inside these countries, these people, they live s segregated lives, so they are not observing each other. So again, they are not, not when you increase inequality, in the beginning at least, it's not noticed. In our country, when inequality goes up, we live much more mixed life. We have shared experiences. We have kids in the same school uh, as the super rich, almost. And um, so when they get much richer, we see it immediately, and then uh, we protest against it, or we at least they got noticed uh, 
for example, nowhere in the world there are so many articles uh, about child poverty mm. uh, as in Norway. But child poverty is, this is not the country where child poverty is most severe, of mm. course. There's the other countries where, but the newspaper doesn't write about it because that mm. is the usual thing in that, in that country. Mm. So, um, uh, so w when does it become, when does inequality become something that leads to riots or dysfunctional societies? I think you, you see it a little bit in immigration flows. That is a consequence of inequality and, and malfunctioning countries with huge uh, uh, problems of their own and that's sort of the temptation to go elsewhere. Uh, uh, I welcome many migrants to, to come uh, according to my view, but I think it is a social it is a, an aspect of a social catast catastrophe for themselves mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that they have to move. Um, the riots in countries, for example, very often it's not the super poor people that reacts. There's somebody who reacts on their behalf. But if, if conditions in the country are very bad, then these groups are willing to go to extremes because the conditions they react upon are themselves extremes. So that means that they are willing to do uh, things that can be really bad uh, things. Uh, and how much inequality, inequality has to increase before these things happen, nobody really knows that. But, but there is a danger that these things happen. As I said, I don't think it is a reaction at least initially, it's not a reaction of the poor themselves, but somebody who claim to represent them, and, and they are reacting to the uh, to the intolerable social situation in the country. Mm. One claim which is also often presented yeah. is that economic growth will fix inequality. As long as we just have economic growth, everything yeah. will be okay. What yeah. would you say to that claim? I, I would say to them then uh, that uh, you have to look at the experiences. I think economic growth has the potential to lift also the poor. It has the potential maybe even to lift all boats. But if you look at what is happening these days with economic growth, there are mm. big groups in most societies that are left behind. So that means that th there are countries that have very high growth these days, China, India, for example, compared to what they used to have, these countries have huge economic growth. And uh, within these countries, inequality is increasing enormously. In China, they have sort of all, all kinds of slogans. Uh, if, if, if you're going to get rich in China, somebody has to get rich first. Mm. But uh, if you're going to be rich first, then th that means that you create inequality. And inequality is a bad thing politically, because those who have more resources have more influence on the policies mm -hmm. and the politics of the future. And that means that they would like to create institutions and arrangements that preserve the inequality that they were benefiting from. So that means when you get somebody get rich first, that isn't the second stage where they redistribute and share the gains. Mm -hmm. Because they, those who have political power then, they will like to, and have all kinds of ideologies that will sort of say that the kind of income distribution that we have now is very natural. It, it is, uh, and of course we were very, we were the smartest guys. We had, uh, uh, we had the merits to, to do, take the right initiatives. In, in the case of uh, China, they just had very good contacts. They were part of the Communist Party, and they grabbed, uh, and they got all kinds of favored positions. Mm -hmm. It's not only that, but it is that as well. So I think good economic and social development is much more balanced in the sense that it goes to everybody. So you, you have to start redistribution from, from scratch. And that means that you have to provide health care services, health services, social security, uh, insurance to uh, groups. Just think about all the females in uh, to take it, all the females in Africa without any support unless there is uh, some sort of pension system. They are taken care of by their families. Um, normally they do as well as they can, but, but that is a very small insurance pool and it is uh, normally way too little to support uh, people who have would be retiring. And in all good societies, you have arrangement for this, and, and you're not creating these things. So I think economic growth 
can be used, but economic growth as we know it has seldom had the consequence of uh, making for more equality. But in countries that have social organizations, unions, for example, which is on the decline almost everywhere in the world, uh, then economic growth has sort of benefited much wider groups, typical of Sweden, Denmark, Finland. Uh, I would also say some Central European countries like Belgium, uh, the Netherlands, and uh, Norway as well. Mm. Economic growth, for example, in these countries with very more egalitarian income distribution have been higher than the economic growth in, in the U.S. Mm -hmm. But this is a consequence of reducing inequality. It's, it's not inequality, it has been reduced by the economic growth in itself. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is, the growth was induced by uh, compressing differentials and uh, it was a hold back in countries where big groups were not sharing in the benefits of growth. Mm. A little bit in the same line, there has been up until now uh, at least some groups believing in the trickle down effect yeah. while it has been counter argued that uh, it is more a trickle up effect yeah. which you talked about. Yeah. What evidence do we have on that? So, there are evidence on both things. Uh, mm -hmm. the, there is some trickle-down effects, but, but it is, it, it, these things, this criticism that there is no trickle-down effect, it, is, it isn't automatic. That's mm -hmm. the point. It isn't automatic, but you can organize things such that you have benefits for the majority uh, of any country. The trickling-up effect is very often, uh, it's, Sometimes you use words like that also for unfair treatments, that you favor the elite, that you have corruption that benefits the elite. So incomes, in the words of uh, the elite, they trickle down to everybody and they lift them out of poverty. They, uh, elites love to speak about lifting people out of poverty, just as if they are not fighting for uh, getting out of poverty themselves. No, the elite comes on and lifts them up and take them, uh, the, give them, the, so they're going to be the real heroes. In reality, what's it, incomes, is trickling, uh, incomes are trickling uh, up into the pockets of the elite in the South in many uh, bad ways. For example, resource grabbing is very typical for uh, all over the world, I think. Is, uh, I, I heard from somebody said, maybe that's an exaggeration, I haven't investigated this myself, that it is very, dif very difficult to become super rich and be completely uh, on the right side of the law and the regulation of society. For sure, it's very difficult to be it to be the right sign of fairness mm -hmm. uh, in society. You become super rich the way people become in some countries mm -hmm. today. Yeah. To have it a command or huge wealth, it's very difficult to be become so rich and following the law. How would you describe the current situation uh, of inequality in the global economy today? Uh, that's a big question. I, uh, I used to use words as a, that it is an inequality crisis. Mm. That it is some crisis of the type that um, that um, they like a financial crisis. They they can't go on forever. It had to be resolved. That's so some you have to. Uh, then you get it. So it's temporary. The inequality crisis is more chronic, it's, it's a sort of more permanent, uh, but it, it can be threatened by the social forces that it creates. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say there is um, a tremendous crisis in the sense that, uh, that um, so few people command so much of the wealth of the planet. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it, it is a political problem, it is a uh, resource allocation problem is also a problem for the utilization of talent. Think about all these talents that go lost in the slum in all countries, at least the poor countries in the world. They have no opportunities to, to sort of uh, show their talents and to, to demonstrate it. Talents that can be usefully used uh, 
uh, for purposes that can benefit a much larger group than themselves, but they never had a chance. And, and these are smart people, very smart people. Uh, there's a typical thing for elitist thinking is that the smart people, they are those who are no high up, uh, the elite. But that would be a very bad theory of uh, how things evolve. Of course, to, be, to survive in a poor country without almost nothing to help you with, you have to do a lot of wise decision in order to really make it. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the competition to survive in, in these environments are much harder. So the selection of people in poor countries is much uh, harder. And as you will see much smarter people uh, uh, emerging there without opportunities mm -hmm. than those who inherit a lot of uh, capital themselves, inherit wealth, inherit uh, a culture, context. It's easy to become rich when, when it's like that. Mm -hmm. And you have a philosophy today in, in many parts of the world but where those who are in command become the big heroes. But um, I don't think they deserve, deserve so much praise as they receive. Mm. Is it possible to have wealth concentrated in the hands of the few and have democracy at the same time? Yes, it, uh, it is a little bit leading question. <laughs> uh, so so uh, the expected answer is no. And I would say, and I, I think there is a reason for it. Uh, uh, so, if you're going to put it in slogans, that then it's um, those who have the gold, mm. they get the rule, and those who have the, have the rule, they get the gold. So this is an equilibrium in the sense that, uh, in the sense that the wealthy get power also over politics, and those who have politics, power over politics, also create a society that maintain their richness. And 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 these things are uh, um, so it is difficult. I'm going to give you an example of a, of a rather good research that, uh, uh, since I'm going to be very positive, it isn't something I have done myself. Uh, it's something that political scientists did in the U.S. They they took all the all the surveys mm. uh, about the people's opinion on on different questions. And they collected all these surveys, uh, surveys and they saw the, the different opinions that poor people had from rich people. And then they saw which of these cases were implemented as actual policies. Th so these were questions asked before, before you know the result, what, what would be the result of the political process. And it's a huge concentration of the cases that the rich favored that were implemented. It could be because they were smart and foresee what policies that were implemented. But I think the, the explanation is the other way around. They had much more influence and they could buy the influence. It is a little bit like one dollar, one vote. Mm. And I think this is uh, it particularly an answer to the question that it is, it is difficult to have um, a perfect democracy, at least, when you have huge inequality in resources. First of all, you can you can nullify the impact of a s progressive policy by by market intervention, and you can uh, buy your influence. And these two things in combined say there is something that is you can't buy your influence on. Then you can sometimes uh, rearrange things by uh, uh, you the way you dispose of your, your, your wealth or your arrangement in the market economy. That being said, I think it is a complementary process between, it uh, can be, uh, between social process, social progress, sorry, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, how should you say, capitalist dynamics. That's been exploited a lot in, in European context, that uh, you can use uh, arrangement to educate people without uh, inherited resources. You can uh, have compression of wages in such a manner that it will benefit also the, the capitalist development, but no in a way that where the, where the benefits from that doesn't only go to the capital owners, but mm. is shared more among everybody who participate in the process. So there is a, 
the social movements can exploit market economies and uh, capitalist development, but then you have to have strong social organization to counteract the power of, of the super rich. And in many countries, these institutions are lacking. And, and I think that, that is a big difference across countries that where, where you can benefit from from the capitalist development mm -hmm. on a more broader base than uh, than than elsewhere. So it, it's um, I, there was a name for these things um, earlier on. I think it's long long forgotten, but I remember it. As it, it, it was called functional socialism. Mm -hmm. That was a socialism that didn't challenge the ownership of capital, but it was a socialism that that redistributed the fruits of the capitalist development to everybody. Uh, not on complete equality, of course, but, but a much more sensible way. And, uh, and uh, so this was to have socialism without, uh, without public ownership. Many people say that this is, many people thought that this was impossible, but it turned out to, to be much more politically possible than many people uh, had foreseen. For example, uh, uh, Rosa Luxemburg, uh, a very good economist uh, uh, and socialist, she taught that um, to have social reforms in a market economy, that would be like the labor of Sisyphus. That's sort of dragging the bullet on top of the hill, and, and then once you are there, then it will go down again, and then you have to go to pick it up again. Reforms would have the same impact, she thought. If you have reforms under, under capitalism, then market forces would erode the consequences of the reforms. Uh, there was also the opposite view that uh, that you couldn't have you couldn't have an efficient market economy when you have a big welfare state. That was the right wing uh, approach to the same question. A little bit later, there's uh, to have one name, Eric Lundberg had that view. He said that you can't have a market economy when you have these big unions and the big uh, welfare state and so on, because they will destroy the market. They will erode any efficiency gain in the, in the in, in the um, private sector. When we can sum up today, the, it is the countries that had exactly what both of them were afraid of. Social reforms, high taxation, redistributive policies, strong welfare states, uh, strong unions. These countries have done quite well. They have even had higher growth than, for example, the US. And it seems to be the case that this is most developed in small economies that are open to international competition. Again, a sign that organizing society in this way is an advantage because you can benefit from uh, international competitive environment in a better way when you share the fruits from it. So there are, there are obvious, in my view, there are obvious gains from globalization. But then you have to have social organizations that share in these gains. Otherwise, you create many losers uh, and a few winners. But if you have redistributed policies, then you can everybody can more or less gain, not in completely equal terms, but more equal, e equal sharing than in other countries. And then globalization is much more popular. You can see just the... the, the the attitude to uh, free trade and global forces mm. in small open economies in, in, in Europe, in particular Northern Europe, that's like 60% uh, think that this is okay. In the US, for similar question, 20 to 30% think it's okay. Mm. So there are huge differences, even though US is almost a closed economy compared to these countries because they have such big domestic markets while, while we have small domestic market and we sell 50% of what we produce on international markets. So I think, I think both the left wing and the right wing skepticism to, mark, to reforms, social reforms and redistributive policies have been proven wrong. Th there is a stable possibility, but you have to fight for it all the time, but it's a stable possibility to enhance productivity in a globalized world if you have a suitable organization of that, and that include a welfare state, include strong unions and social organization. 
And maybe there can be other ways of doing it, but we know there are certain ways that it, it can't be done, and that is the development in, say, in the UK, in the US. This is not the way to, to share the gains for everybody. Thank you. You just answered the question, what is it that the countries with the least inequality do right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Da open we will open the floor for questions. <laughs> okay, so uh, just ask a question on the annual report that Credit Suisse puts out. Um, Oxfam makes uh, numbers out of this. Uh, uh, these reports every year. So in the beginning they said like 80 people owns more than half of the world population and then it went down to 62 people and then it went down to 8 and then it actually increased a little bit this year and and uh, they said that the um, amount of uh, ultra high net worth individual which is the super rich, the people with more than 50 billion dollars in, in wealth have increased uh, uh, with uh, 13 percent last year, I think, and it will increase some 20 percent over the next four or five years. Uh, so this is a kind of we're still talking about inequality here, but uh, uh, I, the I would um, I would just like to know your comments on uh, why it is like that and uh, what the political consequences of this is because you you're probably going to get a lot more billionaires in the time to come and uh, the political consequences of this. Mm. So I, m I mentioned uh, earlier on this uh, concept of functional socialism. In, in that view, then capitalists, they were like savings machines. At least that maybe that's the term that I invented. But I, I'm not quite sure whether that was used when this discussion, but, but they were savings machines. and and. If you are going to have savings machines that are super expensive to run, then of course society has to discuss other ways uh, of, of performing this saving. In in the 50s and 60s, then the savings machine they were moderate people. They they had uh, uh, at least what we could see. They they were basically saving the money that were allocated to them as capital owners. Today we have many capital owners that are expensive to run themselves. They own uh, a lot of luxury, they have a huge luxury consumption everywhere in the world. They have uh, their own yachts, they have uh, whatever. And um, uh, so, so that's one, one thing that there is, it is an inefficiency aspect of a very high concentration of the gain that will create, I think, uh, if it continues, a social reaction. The consequences uh, of um, the rise in the share of billionaires, uh, however measured, I think is um, is of course political uh, concentration of power in in the hands of few. There's one one measure that you can have of of inequality. You can ask how much how much can a rich person uh, buy of people? Say he wants to have an army for the returns on his capital. And of course, if, if, if the soldiers, so to speak, or the, the persons that he can command over, if they are very cheap to buy, because of inequality, they have low earnings, so to buy one of them that is cheap, that number has increased enormously. So that means that the political influence, it, it's just a measure of the political influence that they have. The how many people can you have the command over if you bought, if you bought the influence just uh, by the return of the capital that you have. And you can also rank the rich people. Then you will have be much richer if you live in a poor country. If you are, if you are Mr. Slim in in, uh, in Mexico, for example, with a strange name, Slim. He is uh, uh, super big in in all other respects. Uh, he can he can buy armies of f four hundred thousand people just for the returns of his capital. And everybody will understand that this is this is an inequality that is dramatic. I will end by one thing, that it, it's not true that countries that have a rather egalitarian income distribution don't have many rich people. I think it's easy to become rich 
in an egalitarian country the way these countries are egalitarian. And for example, in, in Norway, we have more billionaires per inhabitant than the US. But our billionaires are not so super rich as the billionaires in the US. We have, in the US has 1.7 billionaires per million inhabitants in, in the country, and Norway has 2.0. Sweden has 2.4. So, so this it's not the case that, that these countries can't have super rich people. So that's also a concern we should have uh, uh, when we look uh, into the, all the aspects of inequality, that we create equality uh, in the majority of the population, and that gives rise to a high fraction, paradoxically, of super rich uh, people. But, uh, but you have to remember that, that two, uh, a fraction of two, uh, 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 the rate of uh, billionaires uh, on the fraction of two per million inhabitants, that means that you have 10 billionaires in, uh, in Norway because we have only 5 million, pop a population of 5 million. So, so that means uh, th there's something with the numbers here that you have to be aware of while, while the, the number in, in, in the US is going to be large, large, much, much larger. But these, these patterns also for lower, for lower limits of, of the super rich, the definition of being super rich, it's also the systematic that both Sweden and Norway has a high share of super rich. So it's easy to get rich in an egalitarian country. And there's something to think about. Maybe we should find other ways, create new savings machines, have more different ways of saving, organize for, other peop for ordinary people to own their own enterprises. Uh, but these are things for the future. There has to be something to substitute for the decline in unions. Mm. A question from me about the, uh, the changing nature of capital. If you study, uh, for instance, the list of the, um, the richest, the biggest companies 10 years ago, you would find quite a number of um, companies working on in oil, natural resources, mm. mining, those type of things only 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. These days, the list is packed with Alphabet, Apple, Amazon, companies producing quite different things. Do you uh, think that development will continue? Yes, I think it will. Uh, uh, it, w it won't replace uh, um, wealth based on natural resources or wealth based on material production. But I think the fraction of things that are sort of uh, produced that are less material uh, mater and it's very mobile across countries, uh, that will increase. And that will make redistributive policies more difficult and maybe even more costly. And these, but, but uh, uh, these are, are challenges, I think, for international tax laws and for, the, I think, the challenges for tax havens. They are, they, all these things have to be viewed in the light of what you just uh, described. And I think it is, um, just to think about the robots, uh, those, who, uh, those, who have the, those who own the robots will rule the world. And uh, if you think about robots more in the uh, extended way than exactly a machine that do things for you, but but uh, including the whole IT uh, sector, for example. I, I think that's a big challenge, difficult to tax, uh, and is inequality enhancing at the same time because it's skill using. Much much of this is you don't need a lot of workers to produce these things. You w the things that are. are used to be done manually is done uh, by the computer itself and uh, and uh, but you need skills on the top in order to develop new things and they will get the enormous share of the of the value added